Hello and welcome to another episode of Podcast DX, the show that brings you interviews with people just like you whose lives were forever changed by a medical diagnosis. I'm Lita. Ron is not going to be with us for this episode. And I'm Jean Murray. Collectively, we're the hosts of Podcast DX. On today's show, we're speaking with Sheila Ames. Sheila is a registered nurse and the founder of Journey into Wellness, which can be found on Facebook and Instagram. Um, Sheila is going to be talking to us today about Common Variable Immunodeficiency, or CVID. Hi, Sheila. Hi there. Thank you so much for having me. I've been really looking forward to this show. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure to have you on the show. Uh, Sheila, this is another one of those conditions that we had never heard of before today. Could you please start us out by telling us and our listeners, what is CVID? I'd be glad to. Um, as you mentioned, CVID is an easier way of saying common variable immunodeficiency. It's the abbreviation. And in the study of immunology, there are three different categories of immune issues. There's autoimmune, which many people have heard of. Mm -hmm. um, that's actually an overactive immune system, such as psoriasis, lupus, type 1 di diabetes, multiple sclero sclerosis. I mean, there's many. There's many mm -hmm. of autoimmune diseases that people are familiar with. Then there's acquired immune, mm -hmm. which became pretty well known back in the 80s uh, with HIV. So it's actually something that you acquire from somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And then there's primary immune deficiencies where you are your own primary source and it's genetically related, such as CVID. Okay. So with CVID, it's actually a genetic mutation that occurs in which we produce very little antibodies to fight off infections or hold memory of different um, antigens. Okay. Um, antigens being viruses, bacterial, fungus, you know, type things. So we don't hold memories of those to fight them off in the future. So vaccines typically produce little to no effect on us. Oh, COVID must be horrible right now for you. Uh, yep, I've been home for a year now. <laughs> oh my gosh. Oh, wow. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Well, Sheila, then I, I have to ask, what symptoms first led you to seek out medical care? And was this diagnosed, at, you know, like at birth? Did they know right away? And how long did it take you or your parents to get an actual diagnosis? Um, well, some people are diagnosed early on, not, not initially at birth. Um, okay. They, there is another type of primary immunodeficiency that's not what I have. It's called SCID for short, um, severe combined immune deficiency that they do test all infants for. It's also known as, you know, remember the bubble boy? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. They do test for that. So they don't test for this because it's, um, well, it's, it's rare, but it's not as life-threatening as SCID would be. So as a child, I... I did have a lot of common colds and viruses, um, whatnot, more frequently than the typical other child, but never realized, I mean, I was a child, my, my parents never realized that it was any more of a problem. Um, it wasn't until, for me, when I started having red flags until like 2011, 2012, when I had frequent back-to-back -back sinus infections and was on rounds and rounds of antibiotics. And I started to kind of wonder, but still just, you know, I was a single mom, kept plugging along, you know, brushed it off. I'm fine. You know, you know, as we do, you know, mm -hmm. we keep doing what we need to do. Sure. And it wasn't until the end of 2014, beginning of 2015, that I developed a really, really bad bronchial infection that lasted for over a year. Oh, wow. Um, yeah. Lots of antibiotics. Um, tried several different things, increased dosage, increased frequency, increased the duration of the antibiotics. Um, through all of that, discovered I was allergic to Leviquin. Um, and then it was, I, I finally did get diagnosed at a, age 40. And that finally, um, there's other people that, that do get diagnosed earlier. It's commonly known to between 20 and 40 years of age, but it can be detected earlier and later. There's, that, there's actually a little girl that I follow on Facebook and um, she was diagnosed at an earlier age and she does, does have it as a more severe, but you know, there was other clues, like when I went into nursing school, they tested for titers, which is mm -hmm. looking at your antibody levels. Mm -hmm. um, so like, say for MMR, you know, a vaccine that most all sure. everybody has had, um, every child does. Right. Um, so they look to see how many antibodies you have to the different vaccines. And when I went into nursing school, that was required and I didn't show uh, antibodies to many. So oh. I was instructed to go get the vaccines again, which oh. I did. And then they didn't recheck. 
And then when I got my first nursing job, they checked titers again. And again, even after I revaccinated as an adult, again, I still didn't have it. So there were flags, but not enough that anybody was able to say, hey, you know, maybe we should send you somewhere else or do some more testing or whatever. Not until that year and a half bronchial, almost year and a half bronchial infection um, did I finally, you know, get more help. Okay. Wow. I wow. think this is the, the longest um, length of time before a diagnosis that we've heard of so far. Yeah, that's yeah. terrible. It's wow. pretty common. Five years is common. Okay. Okay. When I guess when when you think about kids, you think that they're always going to be getting sick. You know, they're they're experiencing right. things for the first yeah, time. Yeah, that so might be of, difficult. Yeah. yeah, for when you're a child. But w- did you notice as you were like a young adult that you were also getting sick more often? You know, I'm kind of one of those people that that brush it off, and I'm strong, and I can push through. I can do this. I'm fine. Whatever. It's just a little virus, and the more viruses I'm exposed to, I'll produce antibodies. You know, right. so it's actually a good thing, but so you weren't paying. Right yeah, you weren't really giving it the attention, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. So mm-hmm. did you end up having to get a genetic test to uh, to show what this was? Uh, genetic testing wasn't part of the diagnosis because um, there's there's many other factors that go into it. Um, not everybody actually shows it genetically; okay. only a small portion. Okay. So. Yeah. So how was it diagnosed then, uh, definitively? Um, well, it took persistence on my part, uh, going to the my primary care provider every other week after each round of antibiotics was completed, and I'm hacking and coughing. I mean, deep, deep, deep bronchial, oh, you know, like seal-sounding type coughs. Um, you know, more tests, tons of labs, tons of labs, you know, chest x-rays, and on and on. Um and it's interesting because medical professionals are often taught that when you hear hoof beats to look for the horses, right. not the zebras. Right. right. You've probably heard that before yep. since you focus a lot on more rarities. Yes. So, you know, because there's more horses in the world than there are zebras. So they look for the commonalities. They look for the common things and they um, push through all of those, rule them out. And I finally, after a year going into, you know, seeing my, I mean, we got pretty close, my primary and I, you know. <laughs> seeing him so frequently he finally referred me to an allergist immunologist told him my medical history told him about the titers told him about the frequent infections and he knew immediately what it was okay um but it takes a series of several different labs um it takes more um distinct type labs that most primary care providers aren't aware of or know of you know like um immunoglobulin subclasses and uh, it took a vaccine trial where you get your titers done on certain vaccines, then they administer those vaccines, and then six weeks later, they retest your titers. And of course, I failed. Okay. Um, which led to my diagnosis. Right, so that's right. that's basically how I, I got to that. So um, insurance companies look for all of that mm-hmm. because the infusions actually cost me, well, cost my insurance company and me paying my part a total of $23,000 every four weeks for life. I'm sorry, what? For life? For life, yeah. And what what is this paying for? Uh, uh, I'm actually receiving immunoglobulins. So that's another word for antibodies. Okay, Mm -hmm. so they're actually giving you what you're what you're lacking. Exactly. Okay, exactly. Okay. And but that's just to keep you from getting the common cold, flu, whatever, right? Uh, It keeps me from anything that people have antibodies to. So the plasma donors, you know, whatever they happen to have antibodies to is what I'm getting protected from. Okay, okay. Yeah, and they actually get like, I I read an article, they get 65,000 donations and mix it all together. So you're getting a wide variety. That's nice though, that's nice. I like that, I like that. It's a global look, so this way you're, you're actually covering more bases. Yeah, exactly. And, and Sheila, what do you think is the biggest misconception about CVID? Um, well, the first thing that just popped into my mind right now is, uh, you know, COVID. Yes. B-I-D. Yes. Oh, <laughs> yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes. Yeah. So that's that's a really, I mean, that's the most recent, of, of course. Of course. Sure, sure, uh, sure. 
you know, most people have heard of autoimmune and acquired immune like HIV, as I mentioned. So people assume that I have an autoimmune okay. disease, which it's not, which, you know, it's not really that big of a deal that people don't fully understand. But mm-hmm. pe- for those who are open to knowing and understanding what it is, I have, you know, being a nurse, I teach a lot mm-hmm. and it's a big part of what I do. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I, I feel like I've I've gotten pretty good at since my diagnosis of being able to break it down and explain it in a way that people understand it hmm. for the most part. But, um, you know, I guess the, the biggest thing I, I, I would like people to know is that it's not a transmissible. Oh, sure. Um, right. It's not contagious. Mm-hmm. So it's it that that's, I think, a really good thing for people to really understand about CVID. OK, good. Um, and how common is this problem? as far as like, um, are there a lot of people in the world with it? And also, does it complicate your work as an RN? I mean, obviously, during COVID, um, Mm -hmm. you got to be really, really cautious. But just in general, is this complicating your work at interacting with patients? Yeah, oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, To answer your first question, it it depends on the source. Some sources say it's one in every 25,000. Some say it's one in every 60,000 people. Um, It's definitely affected my career as a nurse. When I was first diagnosed, I was an ICU nurse. So a lot of people on ventilators, a lot of people with respiratory illnesses, which is my weakness is respiratory and sinus. Um, So my first order for my doctor was no more exposure to infectious patients. Mm. And I was shocked. I was devastated. I'm like, oh, my God, I've worked so hard to become a nurse and helping others is like a calling. It's like an identity. I am a nurse, Mm -hmm. you know. Um, So I ended up as a desk nurse um, working in quality for three years. And it taught me a lot. It challenged me. I love challenges, but it wasn't for me as my, you know, end location for my nursing career. So I talked to my doctor into allowing me to work in home health and hospice. Um, with the caveat that I screen my patients and any other household members for any respiratory illnesses before I go into the home. So he agreed to that. And so did my employer. And so I did home health and hospice until um, just a year ago. Okay. Yeah. And I'm sorry that, yeah, COVID, you know, has certainly put complicated things further. Right. Um, And Sheila, do you know anyone else with this particular condition? And is it something you inherited or did it develop over time? Was it a spontaneous mutation? Uh, I don't personally know anybody with CVID. I live in a rural area. If I'd lived closer to any city, I'm sure that I probably would meet somebody else like at an infusion center or something Mm -hmm. like that that had it. Um, I've infused immunoglobulin into other patients, but none of them actually had CVID. So I've personally never met anybody. and as far as it being identified as inherited, it's it can be. I think I briefly touched on that. But for the most part, the, uh, they don't know what, okay. it, what causes the genetic mutation. There's still so much more to learn about mm-hmm. CBID that people don't really, they don't really know. Immunology is actually a newer field of medicine compared to some others. So there's still so much to learn. And, you know, with the recent COVID, you know, there's, um, I'm sure there's going to be more and more um, med students wanting to go into immunology because there is such a vast amount of information to yet be learned and discovered. Well, okay, so yep. yeah, they're, they're, they're the explorers in the medical field. Right, okay. the challenges are there. Mm-hmm. Um, Sheila, how has, did I already ask you that? No, but you kind of have already touched on this. Yeah, how, how has your healthcare team treated the condition just with the the infusions right and monitoring and keeping you safe is there anything else that we we missed on that question well i could add to it um um, most people with cvid they do receive the immunoglobulin um, treatments as i mentioned Um, there's two routes there's iv Mm -hmm. so you know you get an iv into the the vein Mm -hmm. or there's also subcutaneous you know think of like a diabetes insulin shot it doesn't go into a vein it goes into your subcutaneous fat So what, you know, there's, there's different treatments. Most people with IV, which is what I receive, receive it once every four weeks, whereas subcutaneous is typically weekly. Um, I've chosen IV because of my, you know, I want to continue to work. I don't Mm -hmm. want to have to be dependent to doing something every week and it works for me. So I, I do that. Um, 
And I would really at this time love to give a shout out to any plasma donors Mm -hmm. and or anybody who might be inspired from this podcast that donate plasma because you are truly lifesavers. Um, I donated when I was in my 20s, you know, usually you walk out with, well, then it was like 40 bucks, I believe. But, you know, it's it, it's a much harder process to donate plasma than it is to donate whole blood. And it's it's harder on the body. And I think that's part of why they actually, you know, compensate for that as well. But thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Plasma so donors. without without them, you would, you might not be alive. These people yeah, are saving well, I mean, lives. I would, Mm -hmm. That year and a half bronchial infection could have, you know, became something even more permanent. You know, the longer you have bronchial infections, the more damage you can cause to your lungs. So the big goal is to prevent those so that I don't cause long term damage to myself. Right. And and for all of you that are considering plasma donation, you can do it more often than blood donation. You're not not giving such um, they don't have such stringent time limitations on how often you can donate. And if you're in the Chicagoland area, they will provide you with a lovely movie to watch while you lay back oh, nice. or sit back and, and relax and donate plasma. And it's, um, you know, it's amazing what you can do to save someone's life. Otherwise, please go out there and donate blood. Ever We do, yes. you know, there's a critical shortage at this time. Um, Sheila, what treatments um, for CVID are on the horizon? Are we, you know, is there gene editing, CRISPR? And also have, um, how have... Uh, have you been, like you said, you can't work. How else have you been affected by the recent pandemic? Um, well, one thing that I've read up a little bit on, hopefully there may be some re- some medical students or immunologists who are listening to this and um, may know a little bit more that um, would be interesting to hear from if they wanted to reach out to me. But I do know that they're working on hemato, I might, I might butcher this, hematopoietic stem cells for genetic mutation. Okay. So that is some, one area that I know that they're working on. Um, so that's that's really cool. And as far as the pandemic, as I mentioned, March 13th was my actual last day that I worked before I went home. And so that's definitely affected me. But I did end up um, signing up because I'm not a sit at home, do nothing kind of person. Mm-hmm. I uh, signed up for a nurse coach program and learned how to be a health coach as nice. an RN. Nice. And so I've been doing that, doing a lot of studying, researching. I opened my own business um, so that I can help coach others via Zoom, you know, one on one with them. And it's been a life changer for me because I'm always trying to find, OK, well, here's a limitation, but what can I do? And so because I have that drive, I want to help others also be able to find what kind of things they can do, Mm -hmm. whether it's, you know, it's a change in their profession, whether it's um, a change in their lifestyle, et cetera. But looking at body, mind and spirit, because they all affect each other and finding a balance with that so that people can, you know, become excited about life and and doing what they need to do. So I'm, I'm loving it. Loving it, loving it, loving it. Great. And and part of my ignorance, but um, I I guess I'm a little bit confused. Um, Are you coaching nurses or Mm -hmm. are you coaching patients to make sure that they're adhering to um, their medical care and treatments? I could do either or. Okay. Um, Okay. As a nurse coach, though, I know that is a common misconception because they think, oh, you're coaching nurses. Right. But um, I've kind of gone away from that term for the most part um, and just call myself a health coach. And then you see my RN after my name. So you see, okay, she's a licensed medical professional. She's gone through, you know, X training, et cetera. Um, So I do. I can see um, anybody with any health condition and kind of get to the root because a lot of times lifestyle changes come from uh, they come from older issues that they Mm -hmm. don't really realize why they have blockages stopping them from making whatever changes that they know that they need to make and helping them want to make those things, wanting to improve, wanting to. So finding that that thing in them finding or, or self-limiting beliefs. You know, we all have them. I have them. We're all working on them or hopefully working on them. Oh, that's great. Yeah. 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 Uh, Sheila, have you tried any alternative therapies um, like saline nose sprays or, or anything else that might help uh, with the upper uh, respiratory problems? Yeah, absolutely. Um, saline sprays and rinses, you know, neti pots, et cetera. 
um, definitely done that a lot, but it's very temporary. Mm-hmm. Um, in fact, when I when I worked in the hospital, a lot of times when I would have infections and, and when I was just so clogged up that it was extremely painful, I would get like a 500 mil IV saline bag that was, you know, had been opened too long or something like that, never used on a patient, you know, of course, mm-hmm. never hooked up to anybody's mm-hmm. line. But um, I would grab one of those and go in the bathroom and and rinse myself out just to be able to get me through the shift sometimes. Oh, wow. um, yeah. So, you know, you just use a little short, you know, IV piggyback line and, and, and rinse myself out. But yeah, it is very temporary, especially if you have a full blown infection, more mm-hmm. and more is going to keep occurring. So mm-hmm. it's, it's never it, it, anything that completely clear out okay. an infection. So, you know, as far as alternative therapies, especially with my coaching, I, I really truly believe in the law of attraction and the power of positive mindset. And it's changed how I live with my CBID so much. Um, It might not magically produce antibodies in my body, but it helps me in a way that I can accept what I have and learn um, how to live with it to the best of my ability. And, you know, as we know, stress does lead to illness, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right, for sure. Yeah, unfortunately, yeah, it it definitely does. Um, Sheila, what are some of the less obvious parts of your life that have been affected by this condition? Um, well, kind of funny, um, dating actually. Oh, sure. Um, (laughs) you know, I've, uh, dated some people, it weirds people out that I have to go get an IV in my vein every four weeks for life. And that it's, you know, there's currently no other alternative treatments, you know, it's like, oh, well, I can't go do that because I've got to go do my infusion that day, you Mm -hmm. know? Um, and it also affects traveling. Um, I've given up traveling during the flu season because the last time I did that, I ended up with a horrible, horrible, horrible flu, um, while I was out of town and I ended up having to go to a clinic. And of course I had explained to the doctor what CVID was because most doctors and nurses don't know because it is rare, Mm -hmm. um, explain what it is and explain what my normal treatment is. And he was, you know, he, he knew I was knowledgeable obviously, and he knew I was an RN as well. So he just totally took my recommendations. You know, I wasn't asking for anything out of the ordinary. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, gave me a script for the antibiotic that I need. So I now actually have um, a script of an- a round of antibiotics that I keep on hand that I take at first onset mm-hmm. if I need to take it at any time. Because if, even if I wait for a couple of days, I can I can develop a full blown, really bad, and you know, bacterial infection. So um, that's kind of one of the do. So I have to plan my trips around my infusion dates. And um, yeah, definitely don't travel during the flu season, at least by airplane. I don't. Okay. Sure. Yeah. But that, yeah, that's got to be hard. Right. Uh, have, yeah. It's accepting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. To, yeah. Sheila, yeah. What support have you received during your healthcare journey uh, from f- family or friends? Have they helped you on this? Yeah, I'm mostly, you know, listening and understanding what it is that the struggles that I, I go through and um, continuing to invite me to gatherings, even though I'm more likely to have to turn down an invite because, you know, well, the recent pandemic, I've turned down many, mm-hmm. um, you know, or I might have an, an active infection or I might be a few days away from an upcoming infusion where I know that my antibodies levels are low. But you know, just keeping um, sending me those invites, knowing that you want me to be a part, knowing that you're thinking about me or, you know, for others that are dealing with CVID is is really nice because it can be lonely. Mm-hmm. There are, you see a lot on different um, groups of people who have lost many friends because of it. But I feel very fortunate that um, I'm pretty open and I discuss it and people understand it. Um, so I really encourage others to kind of open those lines of communications with your friends. And, um, you know, I also have created my own support group. It's a journey into wellness for those with primary immunodeficiencies Mm -hmm. that I actually, um, just had a a group meeting this morning, um, ended up being a no-show day, but I do offer those weekly, um, for those with primary immunodeficiencies that want to come. And we have different topics. Like today was going to be um, living with chronic fatigue, mm-hmm. which is common for those who have CVID. But anybody who has whatever the topic is, is welcome. You don't have to have a primary immunodeficiency oh, that's to, to come and attend. So if it's a topic that's of interest, you're welcome. Nice. Okay. Well, yeah, we'll make sure that we post that on our website right. as well. Right. Yeah. Awesome. 
Thank yeah. you. Oh, no problem. We appreciate that. I mean, that's a lot of extra work for you. And yeah, that's wonderful. Um, Sheila, what advice do you have for someone recently diagnosed or whose child was recently diagnosed with CVID? And what's the best advice that you personally have received? Um, well, first of all, take a nice deep breath in and just know that you're not alone and that with treatment, you'll be back to doing many of the things that you were able to do before all of your infections started. So it will dramatically improve your quality of life. Um, having a new diagnosis of any kind isn't something that anybody would want to ask for, but having the diagnosis itself actually gives you the opportunity to understand what's going on with your body and why, mm -hmm. and then you can learn more about it and how to better live with it. Um, personal advice that was given to me um, is kind of difficult because there's, you know, really not a whole lot of people that, that know or understand it, but getting involved with you know, it's reaching out and finding others that have it. So I, you know, got on social media and started, you know, trying to connect with others and seeing, okay, well, what have they been through versus what mm -hmm. have they been through? And, um, you know, you're not alone. You're not alone. Right. That's a lot of our, a lot of our listening audience. That's why they're listening is because mm -hmm. they want to know that they're not alone and that there are other people out there like them. Absolutely. Um, so are there any other tips, hints, or advice that you've got for people that have uh, CVID? Uh, having someone to talk to is really important, someone that's receptive to listening and learning. Um, as a coach myself, I hire a coach as well that I work with to be able to help me move forward in life with goals um, and excitement and passion for life while I'm working with the limitations that I do have. So, you know, working with, you know, whoever it is that you find that, that um, really inspires you and helps you to work through your limitations because there are limitations, but there are also still many other options. This is why you, you incorporate the, the mind, the spirit, and the body. And also it's a great Absolutely. advice for everybody. Right. Yeah. Yeah, for anybody with any chronic illnesses or, you know, even short-term illnesses that, you know, may go on longer than you may feel. It's, it's, it's hard to go through any kind of illness. You know, it's, you're limited, you feel alone. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I know um, for individuals like, for example, and this is just one of many examples, for people going through hip surgery, they said um, it really can be beneficial to have someone, like you said, to encourage them and support them throughout the process because it is, it's a long process for recovery. And if someone is constantly cheering you on, you have a much higher rate of uh, complete recovery uh, and having um, a, su su a successful surgery. I cannot speak. Yeah. So, that, yeah, that's great. Um, you're providing a wonderful service. Mm -hmm. um, thank Sheila, you. oh, thank you. Thank you for um, joining us, our show today. And um, please let us know how can our listeners learn more about you and how can our listeners learn more about Journey into Wellness? Um, thank you for asking. Um, when I first got diagnosed, it was nothing any, you know, I'd never learned or knew anything about this. I went to Google. There's a lot of scary things that can be found on Google, but know that you are your own individual person with different symptoms, et cetera, even with others that have the same diagnosis. So I would encourage people to look at, um, uh, a couple of resources I have that really helped me a lot is the Immune Deficiency Foundation, and they have a lot of free resources. They can be found at primaryimmune.org. Okay. Um, there's also my IG source um, that have helped a lot with many different resources, and their website is myigsource.com. And then if anybody's interested in coaching, I'm at journeyintowellness.net. Okay. And uh, don't be afraid to be persistent with your doctor. You know your body better than anybody. You've lived in your body your whole life, every single minute, every single second of your life. You know when something really is wrong. So be persistent when you need to be. Step up for yourself when you need to be. Be your own advocate. Push for your needs, you know, and of course in a respectful way. But, um, you know, request for a referral. If you're having persistent infections and all the lab results aren't really showing anything, ask for the referral. The worst, I mean, the, the best actually thing that could happen is, you know, they check you out and there really isn't a diagnosis attached to you, you know, um, or they check you out and then you do get a diagnosis and then you are able to move forward from there. So ask for that referral. It took, it took a long time for me to get that referral. Um, I did kept just, you know, putting it off. Oh, it's fine. It's fine. Cause I'd never heard of it, but you know, 
advocate for yourself. Um, you're worth it. Your body's worth it. And, um, that's, that's, I think the best advice that I could give. Excellent advice. Absolutely. Thank you very much uh, for joining the show today, Sheila. We really appreciate everything that you've shared with us. And everything you're doing. Right. No, thank you. And if our listeners have any questions or comments related to today's show, they can contact us at podcastdx at yahoo.com. On our website, podcastdx.com. We're also found on Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, and Instagram. And if you have a moment to spare, please give us a review wherever you get your podcast. As always, please keep in mind that this podcast is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. And always seek the advice of your physician or the qualified health care provider with any diagnosis, treatment, wait, with any, or any, uh, per- one of those. I, it's something. I don't know. I guess I need more coffee <laughs> for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Always seek the advice of your physician or, or other qualified health care provider with any questions you may have regarding a medical condition or treatment and before undertaking a new health care regime. And never disregard professional medical advice or delay in seeking it because of something you have heard on this podcast. Till next week. Mm-hmm.